is ZFM Stereo Talk. But we as analysts, we have a tendency that when we are discussing about the ZIFA issues, we have a tendency of viewing ZIFA as if it operates from the moon. <laughs> and outside the Zimbabwe economy, we are aware of how our economy is operating. These demands were just unrealistic. The talk that gets you talking Mondays to Thursdays between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Business Unusual, separating economic facts from fiction. Good evening, I'm Andy Hodges. Before we start our show today, Business Unusual, um, it was sad to hear that Zimbabwean former Prime Minister and leader of the opposition, MDCT, Morgan Sangarai, died at the Wits Donald Good Gordon Medical Center, where he was being treated for cancer. May his soul rest in peace. Our thoughts are with his family and loved ones. Today and every coming Thursday, we will be giving you a program called Business Unusual, a show which talks everything business, finance and economics. Business Unusual, the voice of business. This show is specifically meant for you to explain and understand business and hopefully to get you the answers and explanations we are all looking for from our business, government and economic leaders. We ask the hard questions here on Business Unusual. Because this show is for you, please feel free to send your feedback via our social media platforms. WhatsApp number 0731-168-045, Twitter and Facebook. I repeat, WhatsApp number 0731-168-045. In the studio tonight for our first show of Business Unusual, we have Confederation Zimbabwe Retailers founder and president, Denford Mutashu, an economist from Bay Zimbabwe, Vandu Zai Zirebwa. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Auntie. Uh, it's uh, actually good to be pioneers. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Consumer Council of Zimbabwe director, Ms. Rosemary Siachitema, said the prices of basic commodities had reduced because of the initiative taken by the government. But there is need to tighten screws on errant business people who make super profits through inflating prices. Denford, let's be honest. The ordinary Zimbabwean believes that you, the retailer, or the retailers, are the ones that are cause for exorbitant super profits. Well, I mean, what would be your comment to this? I mean, this comment by Ms. Rosemary Siachitema is unambiguous. What would you say? Uh, let me start by, of course, extending my uh, sincere condolences to the Trankrai family. Uh, for the loss of uh, Dr. Morgan uh, Richard uh, Trankrai, who passed on uh, on the 14th of uh, uh, February at a hospital in South Africa. It's indeed a sad loss to the rest of the nation of Zimbabwe because uh, you are looking at uh, you know, a Democrat, someone who has been fighting for free, fair, uh, credible elections. And uh, my, my hope and wish is that... Uh, we will, uh, as a nation, deliver uh, free, fair, and credible elections in his honor uh, when uh, the elections uh, arrive. But uh, it is indeed a sad loss uh, to the rest of the Zimbabwean uh, population. Coming back to your question, I would like to uh, depart from a point uh, where we've always said as retailers, we are price takers. Retailers and wholesalers are price takers. What it means is that we sometimes simply uh, pass on to the consumer that which we get from the manufacturer, from the supplier, from the distributor. However, in the same mix, you will also discover that uh, uh, you may have some elements that might try to take, adv- uh, to take advantage of the situation uh, by charging prices that might not uh, necessarily be determined by the market forces, demand and supply, but out of you know insincerity, out of uh, you know the, the, the I mean out of greed and uh, you know the need to to you know, to speculate and profiteer, and this is has been rampant both on the formal and informal uh, business, but uh, it is largely due to the informalized e- Zimbabwean economy. It is also largely due to those uh, you know cost drivers 
that we have always been speaking about that affects pricing in the economy. Hence, we are not competitive as a country. Okay, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, we talk about cost drivers. I mean, in January, the government slashed excise duty on fuel imports and the excise duty on petrol fell by 5 cents per litre from 45 cents to 38.5 cents, while diesel and paraffin declined from 40 cents per litre to 33 cents. Now, fuel is one of the major cost drivers of our country and has a net effect on the prices of basic commodities to the final consumer. And fuel prices in Zimbabwe, however, are still the highest in the region, regardless of the decrease in excise duty. So, the question is, is that, have we done enough? A slashing of the excise duty, if you, can you put it into perspective for me? I mean, what is it as a cost driver in terms of the final product to the, the normal consumer? Thank you very much. Good evening, Zimbabwe. Um, as we, uh, we have but said faces as we mourn the death of uh, Mr. Richard Morgan Tangirai. May his dear soul rest in peace. But as I stand here... Let me introduce myself as Vanduzai for Bay Zimbabwe. Bay Zimbabwe it is a competitiveness driver that seeks to promote uh, production and consumption of competitive goods and services through linkages and opportunities within uh, the local context and regionally. Uh, back to your question, um, Bay Zimbabwe welcomes the move by the government of Zimbabwe to reduce duty for fuel in a bid to reduce even the cost of production of goods and services to meet regional prices. Um, but the general sentiment rather is to say that the government has not done enough um, in a bid to say we have reduced the cost of production because uh, I, I think it was just correctional because uh, previously, let's look at November, December, the price of petrol was about um, dollar forty or something. So when you decrease by about uh, 60, 60 point, 6.5 cents, uh, we have come back to a dollar thirty or less, but regionally we 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 still on high compared to our counterparts. Uh, for example, fuel is about fourteen rand. This is about a dollar um, in South Africa and Botswana and 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 Zambia. So you're saying that even in Zimbabwe now, the cost of fuel is still high. Compared to other yes, yes, we, we, the cost of fuel is a bit still high. But then we 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 we, we applaud the government because this is a move to the right direction. The, 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 a lot has happened, but we are seeing uh, through the president, even in his uh, opening remarks, he indicated really the need for us to address these issues. And we believe we are working the talk. Uh, maybe we might not see the the effect in the short in the short run, but I believe if we could uh, decrease our fuel maybe by 20 percent, because some scholars would argue that a decrease maybe by 10 percent will see the real effect on 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 the cost of production or on direct to GDP. I mean, the point here, of course, uh, Denford, is that. You know, fuel is a major cost driver in terms of your supply chain model here in terms of your retailing sector. But it isn't the only cost driver. I mean, if you look at how prices have reduced, they haven't really reduced all that substantially. I mean, if you look at September to now, prices have gone up between 200 300%. But the fuel price, or the fuel reduction and excise duty, that didn't really put that much percentage back in terms of price reduction. Why, why is that so? I, I think it's uh, pretty much because of uh, the other competing cost drivers that, uh, that require the same agent attention, just yeah. like uh, we saw on, uh, on fuel. Because uh, uh, when we said... Uh, with uh, with the government and uh, through the ad hoc committee which was uh, set up by the government through the Politburo and uh, the office of the president and cabinet uh, through his excellence uh, comrade uh, Emerson Mnangagwa we were upon uh, the vice president uh, uh, you know uh, General uh, Dominic Chiwenga was uh, appointed to lead uh, the, the, that task force or that committee, as it were, in order to meet with uh, the rest of the value chain to interrogate uh, the price increases towards, uh, of course, coming up with uh, you know a sustainable price stabilization uh, model that is also going to observe viability because we may not just come through and say prices must come down with 
about necessarily also looking at viability of the same entities that we, we from which we are requesting prices to come down and uh, looking at uh, such cost drivers fuel is one of them and uh, the cost of money it is also one quite big uh, challenge a quite big issue uh, that uh, has been on the market since uh, the onset of the liquidity uh, crisis in the in the economy uh, you know it's it's an uh, unfortunate uh, end that we've got uh, a liquidity challenge but uh, we've got too much money in the economy that has been created and if you look at uh, the RTGS balances this is why as a uh, as a sector we've always been calling upon the government to sweat the RTGS balances to ensure that the money that is held in RTGS balances across the economy is actually uh, put to productive use so that at the end of the day, because the challenge that we have, the primary, uh, rather the common challenge that we have, which is the biggest challenge in this economy, is low production and productivity. So the moment that we have got that gap where demand is uh, you know, surpassed uh, supply, it means that we need to urgently look at the supply side issues and come up with uh, supply side interventions, which also uh, you know look at affordability on the part of the consumers while addressing viability challenges on the part of uh, you know the manufacturers and business in general, retailers and wholesalers. Unfortunately, uh, if I go back to the issue of for money creation, this this has been going on for a long time, and uh, we also of course expect uh, the same growth on the part of the hard cash in the economy, in the form of the system. Because right now, if you look at the amount of cash, hard cash, which is circulating within the informal economy, it is as high as that which is uh, in, uh, in RTGS balances in circulating in the formal financial system. So there has to be some rebalancing of the economy in order for us to, uh, to have an equilibrium at some point because what we have is a scenario where uh, Company X uh, requires raw materials to be imported from outside uh, for them to actually sustainably produce to meet uh, local demand. Unfortunately, they are placed on a very long queue for more than a month or two before they receive the allocation. So, you know, if you look at production, time is of essence. It's quite critical because if you lose out where you are supposed to produce and equipment and machinery is redundant, labor is redundant, and yet it's a fixed cost, you still need to pay them even though they have not produced because they're coming to work. It's not a, a, a challenge of their own. You have failed to procure raw materials for them to produce downtime. That, 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 those are the real issues that we're also looking at to say fuel, yes, is a cost driver. Uh, foreign currency uh, shortages in the economy it is a, a cost driver. The cash premiums is a cost driver. The power market that is also beset in the economy is a huge, uh, you know, a cost driver. Also looking at uh, the cost of energy, the cost of power, you know, all the utilities. And right now, we actually have been discussing uh, in, in the few, last few days about the quality of water that has actually being delivered in in the case of Ferrari. It's, it's it's not the right water that you would require for production. You cannot just take that raw water straight into to, into production. You have to, to, to start by purify, purifying it or going taking it through certain processes which is a cost again to production which you not, do not need to to foot in any normal economy where water would have been uh, you know normal water that is coming through to industry. So my understanding then from what you're saying is that it isn't just about fuel. It's about the imports, for example, to make the product. It's about the manufacturers, exactly. the, the equipment and so forth. But exactly. I mean, you're in a bit of a quandary. I mean, that, that's quite, that's quite, a, uh, quite a hard thing to solve, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. And because f- from one end, what, what we have, the, 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 you know, what we have in, in the Zimbabwean economy is that from one end, this is an open economy. We are saying demand and supply must determine prices. But on the other, we also have other policies that are not speaking into that openness of the economy. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, right now we've been interrogating, you know, SI64 to say those products that are protected under SI64, those companies that have been protected under SI64, should actually then come out there and show us and show the nation of Zimbabwe that we were protected all this while. These are the, the you know, these are the positive things that we have, been, we have managed to build. For example, in terms of production, in terms of employment, uh, you know, figures, in terms of, you know, the, the number of lines that they've managed to introduce onto the market. Because previously, if they were running one line, they're now running three or four other new lines. 
so, so those are the positives that we want so that at least the consumer when they are they are doing their shopping they are actually making their shopping based on the information that has been provided to them this is the reason why even in our in our interaction with the government government is actually said we are not going to come through and price control because you know price prescriptions have never worked especially when they were introduced back then in 2007 and 8 the in, in any case they caused uh, you know the the destruction of the moral fabric of the economy and we later on even did not find did not manage to get goods from the former uh, rather from the former system from the former economy so f- from that basis from that understanding and uh, from that uh, uh, quite informed position, I think it is actually within uh, the right context that the government also agrees with the business that price controls do not work. However, we also need to come up with self-regulating mechanisms. This is the reason why government has also come up and said manufacturers must actually indicate publicize through the various media the price, the recommended selling prices, the recommended retail prices and recommended also prices so that if anyone is charging a price beyond that the consumer is informed because they know that for example cooking oil you know, we have seen adverts that are being flighted by you know uh, oil processors which is quite positive because a consumer has got to know that this bottle of two, two liter bottle of cooking oil uh, on average is got to be sold at an average of say three dollars 45 if someone then is selling at three dollars 99 then that's that's uh, you know profiteering despite of course having different uh, cost builders but the, there's no way that the difference can be that much you know among us the, the players in the retail sector so you have seen those uh, adverts you have seen those publications it's a welcome development and i think that has also to continue and spread across the other manufacturers so that consumers are made aware of what they have to buy these products at. Remember, this is your show, so please feel free to give us your feedback. Uh, I'll repeat our social media platforms on WhatsApp 0731 168 045, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, please, we'd like to hear from you. Um, Fanduzai, we talked about SI64. Denford mentioned SI64. Now, has this achieved the required results, the intended results that we wanted it to? To be honest, as uh, where we come from, uh, SI64 has been a weapon that we needed at the time we used it. Um, if you can see, there is a revival in the manufacturing sector for some of the FM, M, FMCGs. For example, cooking oil. Um, I cannot point uh, the companies that have located to Zimbabwe, but I can surely tell you through SI64, we have got companies that set up uh, even in Mutare, uh, oil processors they are happy with the progress of SI 64 so I thought I think uh, from our point of view SI 64 was necessary maybe it might be insufficient but it was necessary at that time and um, uh, what we have realized or what we are is going forward we have come, we have come up with a local content policy which is going to come up soon which you which will try to encompass all the policies that have been through before to to say that how can we revive local industry how can we um, make sure that the local industry uh, because uh, as we, mr mtashu was talking about the cost drivers and the cost structure definitely where we are from uh, in the manufacturing sector or any other sector in Zimbabwe um, we are not yet at the same level playing field with our regional counterparts. We have to address certain issues, if, like for example our tax, tax system our tax system is a bit uh, on the high side compared to the other other regions. We have to address that but in the meanwhile we also have to make sh- ensure that the local industry is on the on the go um to just to clarify by zimbabwe is uh, not for uh, just um, blind protectionism by zimbabwe is uh, there to say we want to be competitive regionally globally and we also want uh, to ensure that demand consumption in, improves local consumption improves because right now we 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 can sit here and talk other things but to be honest our consumption in any Thing in Zimbabwe is depressed because um, we have got um, minimum or depressed income or okay. so we our discretionary income is low which means we have to our policies should target to improve our income and demand and the economics are, will 
to that, you know what what then happens. But how do you marry uh, the by Zimbabwe with the possibility that locally produced products are more expensive than imported products? So, I mean, in that situation, what what what, what would you do then? I will agree and disagree. There are certain um, products that people think that they are foreign, while it's their local. I think there is issue, issue of information sharing and dissemination. We buy Zimbabwe from inception. That was that was our target to say that we need to showcase our products. We need people to know which product are ours, and also uh, uh, from where we come from, it's make and buy Zimbabwe. We also engage the the manufacturing sector to say that how can we address the issue of pricing because like i said we are a competitiveness driver we want to address we want to ensure that if we are importing a product as far as china and it's landing in zimbabwe with a price that is lower than the production in zimbabwe so we need to merge the two and say that let's have our products at a level playing food so people have then the choice as the consumer needs to have a choice to decide which product to buy but at the end of the day they need to buy local to save jobs and create jobs i see so so this is this is i get you so this this is about making sure that zimbabwe has has produces its own products at sure. a competitive price definitely and not and not to be protectionist as as people would believe that the yeah. instrument is meant definitely Denford, um, you're on record saying that selected suppliers and manufacturers protected under statutory instrument 64 struggled to meet demand in 2017. Situation expected to change in 2018. I mean, you're in a rock and a hard place, aren't you? I mean, SI 64 is protectionist legislation, agreed? Yet at the same time, you need to be at the stage whereby Zimbabwean business can stand on its own two feet and compete with the rest of the world. Um, so if, if currently the people protected by SI64 are not meeting demand. I mean, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, it, 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 it came uh, as a result of a plethora of challenges that uh, they indicated that they were facing. For example, uh, one of the issues that was quite topical is that uh, the, the, the local manufacturers did not manage to get 50% of the uh, foreign currency requirements during the course of the year. And uh, that speaks volumes to their capacity and ability uh, to produce and uh, meet local demand. So I think it's also quite quite a, a real issue. Uh, however, I think uh, I'm, I'm I want to disagree with uh, uh, Vandu Zai because where she says uh, there is no demand. I think there is, there is demand uh, in, in Zimbabwe for both locally manufactured goods and imported uh, commodities. So it's an, it's an issue of uh, uh, then prioritizing the allocation of uh, the foreign currency and ensure that uh, the, 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 the companies that are requiring foreign currency receive the foreign currency because one of the challenges was uh, the issue of misallocations. We, most companies were complaining that uh, while the RBZ would have done a great job by ensuring that the allocations are done uh, in, a, in a proper manner but a lot of the recipients did not receive the foreign currency so they also is, is need to interrogate the the whole you know process the whole channel of for foreign foreign currency allocation to ensure that who is whoever is is got to receive the foreign currency receives it as and when uh it's it's it's, it's required but uh i think if you if you look at the scenario in 2017 uh towards the end we saw price escalations and uh, various reasons were uh, proffered but i think overall we we all agree that it is very difficult then to police a market way you are failing to adequately supply resources for example where people have got that business has got to rely on the parallel market as a, a consistent source of foreign currency for them to import either finished goods or raw materials then to then try and ask them to sell their products at a certain price you wouldn't know because someone might still come out and say no my forex i did, I did bought it i, I got it at 60 percent i didn't get it at the normal uh, you know that that you you call uh, the, the the you know the current price. market market rate in informal market rate of 45 45 percent so th- th- those are the issues to say for as long as as a country as a nation as an economy we are getting down to say to plan with the parallel market in mind 
I think there's something wrong there. We need to change that mindset. Let's harness the foreign currency which is found on the informal market and ensure that we do the proper things that will attract the same cash, hard cash, which is in the informal sector circulating in the informal sector, which is actually staying under the pillows in various homes. A lot of people have got money that, you know, in terms of hard cash that they might not want to use right now if someone has got $100. They're not willing to part with it. Sometimes you have a scenario where someone goes to the prior market, they change into, into bond notes. After that, they change into, into, a, into electronic money, be it mobile or plastic, and get a premium. So the, the moment that there is a premium, we've got a problem. So the Arab is it, he has got to eliminate that premium. They also have got to ensure that the, the, the RTGS balances do not need to continue to grow because it is continuing to affect you know the the, 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 the running of the rather even coming up with a monetary policy, a, you know, a competent monetary policy statement. But we I hope that especially if you look at uh, the recently uh, you know announced pronounced monetary policy statement, it is actually focusing on growing exports. It is focusing on uh, uh, ensuring that uh, we grow uh, production. It is also ensuring that those those major major you know foreign currency earners that we have always been relying on like the key the five products like your uh, your platinum, your gold, your uh, you know your chrome, your tobacco, you know your you know your, your, your uh, I mean your diamonds. They, they require, they get the necessary support, just like we have seen the Arab it upping the support that they are giving to gold uh, pro- production. So I think that is the right way to go. However, that should also happen uh, at the same time that we are also trying in the short term to address the foreign currency shortages immediately. Because that will work in the long term. But immediately, uh, company X require foreign currency or if they, uh, if they export Rather, if they import the, the, the raw materials, they have to pay for those raw materials. But if there is no money, if they are not getting allocations, we've got a challenge. Mm. I think we'll, we'll carry on talking about this foreign currency aspect of, of manufacturing and retailers. But we'll take a break now. But please feel free to uh, send us your feedback. Uh, WhatsApp 0731 Twitter and Facebook. We'll be back in a moment with Business Unusual. A one, two, three, let's go. Let's CFM Serial Talk. Minister of Primary and Secondary Education, Honorable Dr. Lazarus Dokora. Different quarters uh, from uh, uh, people who are opposed to this, from some parents, is that they were, they were never consulted, that they never had this, an opportunity to have their say. If consultation takes place and you miss out on participation, uh-huh. do you say that consultation was not done? No. The talk that gets you talking, Mondays to Thursdays between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Business Unusual, separating economic facts from fiction. Welcome back to Business Unusual, CFM Stereo, my station, your station. Uh, So, we left it on foreign currency and I think um, it's important to appreciate this local content because apparently 75% of products on shelves at the moment in retailers are perceived as uh, local con- local content or local products. Frank Desai, is that correct? Is it true that 75% of products on shelves are actually local products? What, what, what I can I assure you is that uh, since the inception of Pai Zimbabwe in 2011, the uh, local content in products and serv- usually in products has improved. Um, what I can assure you now is that the local content in products in the sh- uh, shops has been improving. Um, my understanding is that um, once industry is supported, once industry is given a window period, um, it can be revived. Uh, many countries have done that. You can you can go through the Amer- the Buy America Act. You can even go through down south in South Africa. That has been done. But now it's on the methodology that has to be followed. 
to come back to your question that 50 percent of local 75 percent 75 percent really i think that is our vision i cannot agree that uh, all products are on 75 percent but we will be glad as we are where we are coming from together with the min- minister of industry and commerce we cannot have a blanket threshold local content threshold okay. it differs from each and every sector in fact in fact that 75 percent local products quote then for it was actually from you uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. said shelf space currently has seen 75 percent local products occupancy and the remainder being imports especially in yes stores. in terms in terms of shelf space mm. this we could applaud the retailers some obviously they differ but we really have seen that local products have been given the prime space is that a- yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's actually quite agreeable because uh, uh, what, what we're looking at end is that uh, uh, just like what, what uh, Langiza has, has said we actually have certain uh, an extreme scenarios where uh, certain uh, local uh, big big chains have decided to say we sell 90% local and only 10% uh, in, in imported. And uh, some have even gone to open branches in, in Baybridge, just, which is much, much closer to South Africa and still operating profitably. Uh, well, you know, uh, with, I mean, yet, yet they're competing with uh, those products that can easily come through the border. But uh, the, the, the situation that we have end is that uh, uh, w- whether we should protect to capacitate or we capacitate and then protect because i think that, that, that that's, that's the scenario that we have in in view of sa 64 it's quite a very good policy but the moment that it is not supported with adequate resources if it is if it is not resourced then we begin to have gaps this is the reason why i spoke about the discrepancies between demand and supply in 2017 and it also coming through uh, you know being imported into 2018 the challenges have not been resolved because apparently we are saying you know, SE64 pushed uh, production, it pushed capacity in, in various uh, in, uh, local companies uh, that we can even mention uh, so that the consumers would know. Uh, but I think the challenge was, did, it then, did we then follow through with uh, providing the necessary foreign currency for them to continue to be on their feet? I think we, we were found wanting because the moment that we have got 50% of the requirements in terms of foreign currency only having been met, then I think it speaks volume. So what we're simply saying here is that as retailers, apparently, we wouldn't mind, we don't really care, if, as it were, not to say we don't care, but where, where the money comes from, whether it's from a local product or from an imported product, right. as long as money goes into the team. That's, that's the one fundamental, it's a fact, actually. It's but a profit and, this is a profit and loss business. It, 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 this is business, actually. But what we did deliberately was to say, we are part of this economic, economic revival uh, you know, paradigm, and we need to play our part. What did we do? We deliberately then changed our procurement, uh, you know, policies, internal procurement policies to say the majority of our procurement, our sourcing of products, let's source from the local manufacturers. This is the reason, despite even now the terms of uh, trade being changed, where we used to enjoy 30%, we now on 7%, uh, rather uh, 30 days, you know, 30 day terms, now we are on 7 days and sometimes some of them are demanding cash, but we've continued to source goods from uh, the local manufacturers because it's cheaper, it's convenient because if, if you're talking of, say, a flower, you can just replace an order and then it, it gets through. The hassles of getting it from South Africa or anywhere else, it's not, it's a huge cost to the business because sometimes you run out because you cannot control what happens at the border or along the, you know, the, 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 um, in the road. So those are the issues that we're saying is the retail sector. We've played a huge, a significant part in the economic revival of this country because we are stocking 75% of locally manufactured goods. Though the question that has always been asked is how much of that product is local? Well, in fact, that's, that's exactly the yeah. question because, you, I mean, you know, people believe that when you say 75% local product or local content, so to speak, it means that everything in that product is actually made in Zimbabwe. But that is not true. Well, no, if, if you look at cooking oil, for example, we're importing soybeans. 
Mm. And uh, w- the one who makes the, the packaging is importing everything, almost everything. And, uh, right. you know, so, so pretty much from the bottle to the bottle top and uh, to the product inside, all, almost all the ingredients and the so, raw materials. So this is really, imported. again, but, but, down to supply chain. Sorry. Yeah. Wh- what I think is we have to start somewhere. In those products that we have co- got a competitive advantage, I think we should also continue to source locally. For example, if you're seeing that we are importing crude oil, Yes, let's import crude oil, but what are we going to do in the environment that we have imported the, the crude oil? It means that we are going to create jobs. And when we create jobs, obviously, like I said previously, our consumption right now is a bit depressed because of low disposable income. And I continue to state that because I, I, I believe Even that... I, have, disagree. <laughs> I believe... I'll continue to disagree, which is fine, yeah. I really, I really think that um, when the, the fundamentals are right, obviously, for example, if fuel that we're talking about, if we decrease fuel maybe by 50% and we, we, we have got more, more income to other goods and services that we can buy and we increase our discretionary income mm. and when we increase our discretionary income which means my bundle my monthly bundle will increase and what does that mean to the cooking oil producers it means more sales and what does it, it mean to you mr touch it also means more sales so what from my point of view is that if the fundamentals are made right obviously we want these big players to come let's they should come and we are open for business. Zimbabwe is open for business. 100% but, Zimbabwe is open for business. Yes, but at the same time, we also need to prepare our companies. We also need to prepare our manufacturers because obviously if a foreign company comes, there's certain payments to be made. They have certain dues to certain be made. Certain guarantees as well for the investment yes, in the country. Yes, obviously they will repatriate their capital and also for them and so on. While it's the local company, we need to capacitate them so that they can compete. At the same time, they are also taking care of the the, the, the locals. The locals. But, but my, my, my argument, Andy and uh, London, is that let's not fall into the trap of trying to please the free investor before we also deal with our own local True. investors. Because True. if 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 someone is Invested a domestic investor has actually, you know, plowed lots of money into their business, and then they are grappling with the challenges that we're speaking about. And yet, we are saying, Yes, we are open, we're open for business. It's, it's a very good narrative, we are open for business. But let's also look at the domestic investor. True, true. Are they able to, uh, you know, to harness? Are they able to then operate, you know, viably? Are they able then to you know to compete? Are they able to all those competitive issue, competitiveness issues, all those cost of cost drivers issues, the cost of labor in the country? It's not like we will have a cost of labor for an investor who is coming tomorrow, which is different from the one who has already invested for the previous years. Because let's also recognize those that those that have invested during these particular difficult times. Because it, if it wasn't for those. We could not have been where we are right now, and we could not have been like the new policies. (laughs) So we we need to also to interrogate that to say, while we are open for business, but are we also ensuring that those that have invested have got the same uh, you know attention in terms of uh, the issues that they have? I but I also do not agree with you, Andrew. I'm sorry <laughs> that uh, your demand is is is, is depressed okay, in this so economy. Okay, so explain that. How do you? you know, yeah, because what what we have the moment that we have got, uh, you know, uh, in any case, if manufacturers are failing to meet the local demand. Then it means this, the, the economy is actually on a high consumption mode. That's number one. And then number two, it also certainly then means that uh, uh, there is demand in the economy. Actually, is in terms of you know for any investor that would wish to come into Zimbabwe, demand is there. The market is there. Even if you look at those uh, distributors that were here before SI sixty four, they stopped who stopped bringing in products because they were asked to to, to, to ask their principals or the principal uh, companies or suppliers to come and set up here, which we have already seen uh, from companies like Pepsi, they've already set up a very huge plant here. So those actually then realized that the market for their products was there in Zimbabwe. This is the reason why they've taken a step forward to say, even if you look at the oil processors, let's set up a plant in Zimbabwe because demand in terms of the market is there. CFM Stereo, my station, your station. This is Business Unusual. Um, 
It's interesting. We, I'm looking at the CCZ uh, Consumer Council of Zimbabwe monthly index, and if I look from January 2017, where it was up as high as 590, okay, and it went as low as down to 575, and it's now pretty much back up and above 590, okay, so in other words, for a family of six. Um, you know, that, that's quite dramatic in terms of a local and ordinary citizen and, and what he has to spend for. And as you talked about disposable incomes True. and about the fact of to find money is hard to get now and jobs and so forth. I mean, isn't, isn't that a worry for you? In terms yes, of- there is always a cost attached to that. It's, there is always a cost attached to transacting. So what, what, what we are saying is that if we improve our production... I will continue to say that production, production, production. <laughs> if we improve our production, these are the challenges that we are talking about. For for example, with with stagnant, I, I know that we have got stagnant real 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 wages uh, for now because if a dollar could buy things like last last month. If that dollar cannot buy the exact thing that you, I think that is depressed um, consumption for a household, right. which I think if we improve on our um, the other fundamentals that we are talking about, the, the current issue, the liquidity issues, and the tax the tax system uh, in Zimbabwe, I think that will leave a, a person. For example, if we are saying. Um, off, off my head, I think if we're saying that the tax that uh, we are getting is about 67 cents per liter, which means it's a bit too high, which means the amount of petrol that we I should be using each and every day, even organizations, even businesses, is a bit too low compared to the one that the, our counterparts or our regional uh, counterparts are, are, are using. So this issue really is if we improve our on our production right yes <laughs> you know one one thing i think i i've noticed or i've noticed particularly in retailers and in fact denford you've mm-hmm. been quite vocal about this issue mm-hmm. is the fact of merchants charging 25 percent premiums in fact if not more um on mobile transactions now now you've said that mobile growth or the growth of mobile banking and mobile platforms has actually helped your your organization or the retail retailers in general and this 25 percent premium and sometimes up to 40 percent premium yeah, yeah. that's a cost to a consumer that's a hidden yeah, yeah, yeah. cost i mean that 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 can't that can't be allowed to continue can it surely yeah yeah from that end i think it uh that's 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 where i can agree with land that it diminishes the uh purchasing power of the yeah. consumer so the purchasing power really would diminish because where, where you have uh, you know a hundred bucks and you want to take it out and then someone then decide to charge you 25 percent I mean, that's this 25 percent. Someone is making 25 percent out of nothing, and uh, that 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 mentality, the dealer mentality, which has gripped the nation, has got to go. People have got to start living a form of formal lives, and uh, you know, move away from this uh, dealer mentality. But uh, of course, sometimes it's not of their own making because it is a from a point of departure from where we are coming from as an economy, yep. a law base. Yeah, but, but you say that though. But however, I mean, this is just a created percentage, isn't it? This is just the yeah, market it's, it's, creating it's, it's, something. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, Actually, real, it's but the bond note, one bond note is but, equal to one US dollar and so forth. I mean, this is just coming from, yeah, 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 where, the, from, the, from the street or from... Yeah, the, the challenge there is the issue of the value of the RTGS that are actually on the, on, I mean, in the economy. And the RTGS have become a currency. You know, if you talk of a multi currency, I think let's right. include the RTGS right. and they have created this, this half of... Because if you've, got, if you've got 100 bucks in your account, it's not like it's the same equivalent to if you want cash, hard cash, if you want to, to, to hold hard cash for, for whatever reasons. So that diminishing, you know, or whatever, uh, the, 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 the diminishing value is the one that has got to be corrected. But uh, going forward, I think we, we, we looked at uh, you know, production, we looked at other teachers' balances, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of SI64. But I think, I think going forward, it's, what is what is encouraging right now is the political will. 
previously, uh, previously we didn't used to have political will. Now, political will, policy, political will. Yes, because uh, in terms of policy, willingness to revamp the, 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 the archaic policies that have been hampering, uh, you know, ease of doing business. For example, government is actually pledged to say, they, you know, I'm sure it's something that they're working on. They, they, they're working on uh, reducing the regulatory charges, charges and costs by 50 percent, and uh, in addition to the reduction of the price of uh, price of fuel. So I think we also need to appreciate that the government currently is uh, escalated the issue of price stabilization to the you know presidium level. And I think that goes to show the seriousness, the seriousness and the political will. However, we need to put uh, the talking to action. We need to see more action, even if we don't speak, even if we don't see people talking. But let's have people working people coming up with uh, you know you know implementation to say if we have said this is going to happen what is the time frame especially if you give if you, if you look at the 100 days if we say we're going to have uh, locomotives arriving in Zimbabwe we see them they have arrived i think that that on its own will also give uh, or improve confidence but the issue of confidence Andy, is critical in this economy someone or uh, you know uh, people are not willing to take their money into the banking into the bank if you're holding 100 bucks right now, you're not willing, willingly walking into the bank to say, can you can you keep my money? I'll come back after a day or so and then take it because out. Because simply you're not going to get it Without back. me it being back given three or rather, you know, conditions to say you can only take out this small amount of cash, but the rest you have got to, you know, use mobile or plastic. That on its own has got to improve. Okay. The bank charges have got to come down. If, if we're really serious about this matter, then we need to interrogate the fact that we need money in the banks. And it should actually be a, a, a choice for the consumer, whether they want to, you know, to swipe, they want to use mobile, or whether they want to use cash. And, or they might not use cash because they know that it's there. Because the panic is that the cash is not there in the bank when they want it. So let's improve that so that we improve confidence in the right. system because we need people to begin to bank whatever that they have under the pillows. We need business also to start banking because business, if you generate cash, sometimes if you see in the inform informal retail and wholesale sector, they are not banking. A lot of, you know, uh, they, they are not banking. Yeah, but they're not banking because they believe they cannot get their money yeah, exactly. back. Exactly. Those are the issues. It's really the issue of confidence. It's really the issue of confidence. But I, 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 I I would like to applaud the government and uh, um, especially his excellency because uh, from his, his inauguration speech and the, he has really been walking the talk and I'm 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 confident I'm seeing I'm I'm hopeful yeah let's let's take each step as we address uh, this fundamental I, I think I think a good step and even from the government and from President Wanangagwa in fact is this concept or, or the attitude change amongst business in, in the sense that. There's more vibrancy. There's more hope and more engagement. more engagement. There is more information sharing and engagement. Yeah, I like that very much. Yeah. Now there is something which I, I know we get a lot of questions about, and it's about this RTGS because we hear it in papers, and and yeah. it, it's a, it's an excuse used, I think, by a lot of people, if I can call it that, to justify certain things. Maybe simply, um, Van der Zee, could you just uh, maybe just tell us what is this RTGS that everybody's talking about, and and so ordinary people can actually understand how it has an impact on prices and how it affects them as consumers. Obviously, it's uh, the issue of, from where we can say, the issue of time. Uh, because when you, you, you transact, it, it will take a bit of a time and there is also a cost attached to it. And this is um, maybe su superficial because the money is just circulating. But I think uh, what we can do is I think we, we need to, to embrace and really the issue of, of charges may be the, the major issue around the RTGs. Right. I mean, yeah, Denford, I mean, please... Uh, Explain our teachers. I mean, if you like, uh, as a well, retailer, yeah. how, how is this? Yeah. But basically, this is uh, in, uh, in in monetary terms, real time growth settlement. We 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 of course, uh, you saying that uh, you you you. you You've got money in your account, and uh, for for domestic transaction, you want to pay for 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 for, for, for a delivery. You can uh, you know you can do uh, an internal transfer. You can do uh, you can uh, do internet banking. You can go to the bank and uh, uh, you know make a payment through the the, the real time to a settlement center. The, the 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 one who has given you the commodities receives the money. But what what then has happened is that it is the value 
the value of the, the, the that money which is in RTGS form after a customer has walked through your store and swiped and after a customer has walked through your store and used mobile money and uh, the money gets into your account and you want to pay for goods from company X and then company X also then attaches a certain value of that amount to the stocks that you are going to procure to restock because for example you say initially you you acquired these three boxes at uh, uh say uh, you know a thousand dollars and then the next time that you're going back because they feel that they're not secure in terms of that value you know there's no security in the value of that rt just money because of inflation because of many other issues they attach or actually you know put a premium <laughs> on that RTGS. Right. That also pushes a product up. I mean, we're talking here not a just price. a three-stage yeah, pricing yeah, yeah. model, a four-stage pricing yeah, model. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And uh, this has also created this multi-tier uh, pricing system because the, the supplier is saying, if you are buying using cash, this is the price. Mm. It's, you're, you're not going to pay a thousand, but you're going to pay, uh, you know, forty uh, percent less. Right. If you're going to buy using, uh, you know, if you're going to come through and swipe, you're going to pay a thousand. If you're going to use mobile money you're going to pay to pay uh maybe a thousand hundred and, and the but point if is you, that if you're you, going to move you're going to pass on those costs you, to the you're going to pass on the, to the consumer because if, sometimes they say if you're going to buy using bond bond notes you're going to pay uh, i mean a, a, a different price so the retailer or wholesaler sometimes simply passes on that cost structure uh, to the consumer because it is a cost to a retailer and you know in any case we are happy that inflation currently it ended the year on uh, i mean around 3.5 percent and uh, the, the 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 regional target against the regional target of uh, in the subject i think is the, the target is 3.7 3.7. So yeah. we, we are still within, uh, you know, the, the, the right percentage, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, inflation. But it, it might also grow given how how we have managed uh, how we have managed the fundamentals that we are speaking about right. but inflation the current inflation in zimbabwe is not benefiting business okay. it's not benefiting the consumers right. so mean, we need inflation that is real that benefits the consumers the, right. that benefits the uh, i mean the, the the business because during the deflationary environment a period where we're coming from remember the policies then we were interrogating policies on how we should stimulate demand but now it's the other way around. How can we, you know, arrest this demand, which is huge, which is the, right. the market, which I mean, has been pushed by the money that has been created? Yeah. I asked you about RTGS because, I mean, as of September, the figures I have, there was an estimated foreign payments backlog of over $600 million. So in essence, you have this RTGS or real-time growth settlement, or, right? Yeah. Whereby, whereby money or orders are waiting to be satisfied from foreign currency coming in. And basically until they are, that they can't be paid and so goods and services can't be paid for and yeah, it's, just, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. building up and building up i mean that is what basically the impact of rtgs yeah. on prices is yeah. correct yeah true actually okay. the challenge the end is that if you've got that money in your rtgs balance you cannot pay your external supplier you, you know like you you, you would previously you have do. the money in your account you have the money in your account the foreign currency to pay the, but you would, the bank would ask you to bring hard cash for them to be able to process your payment or you just have to go through that uh, uh you know the the, the allocation waiting list, so the, the, the waiting the priority list which sometimes you tend never come so those are the issues that we're saying you've got money in your RTGS balance but it's, it's it's money that is that you can only use in, in on the domestic market because when you, and yet a lot of the raw materials we are we are getting them from outside a lot of those goods that we're still not able to produce here we're getting them from outside well, a retailer wants to portion of the products that you have to produce you have to get from outside you have to import. yeah true those I mean, are the fundamentals that, we, that you're talking about. Yeah, that's the fundamentals. Now, you, you've been mentioning bank charges, and, and it's true. It's, it's one of my bugbears, I must be honest, because the bank charges, you know, I, I have this theory as, as an ordinary person. I, I put my money into a bank. Um, the bank then charges me monthly monthly charges for keeping my money. Um, if I want to transfer it, they charge me again. Yeah, uh, The bank doesn't pay me interest on some of my accounts, and um, I'm not able to get cash. I mean, that to me is, is, is a hidden charge. I mean, that, that again... Similar, similar to what we spoke about on the on the merchants adding the 25 percent is a hidden charge as well what, what we need to do as a country is to to cultivate a, 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 a purpose of, of saving but with the current uh, situation I think consumption is on the rampant is rampant because there is no 
there is no a culture of saving because there is also no confidence in the banking sector. Um, there are issues that we, we have been trying to address the issues really on the issue of, of, of confidence in the banking sector, in the banking fraternity, where we are saying that a lot of money is in the in informal sector, as Mr. Mitashu was putting it across. We need to harness that kind of money to be in the... I need to be confident that my bank can help me save my money and when it's five months or a year, I can go and get my money with interest to right. my part. Right. Well, I mean, thank you very much for that. Um, you know, we could talk here for hours. I can see there's so much <laughs> to talk about holistically and, and how we can solve this and I'm sure that we'll have you both back later. But before we go, um, I understand, Gwendozai, that um, uh, by Zimbabwe has a, a conference, or maybe just in a minute you could explain briefly what it was about, and um, you know, as quickly as you can. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, by Zimbabwe, this is the third uh, procurement conference, but with this, uh, the recent reconfiguration of the Public Procurement Authority to concentrate on the oversight role, while decentralizing authority to procuring entities, the objectives really of the conference is to provide a po- an opportunity for stakeholders to unpack the new procurement act to understand the opportunities in the public and private and in the NGO sector because we believe that a, a, a lot of money is coming through the, uh, the the NGO sector EU World Bank and all other 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 e- e- areas so we want to create a stage where uh, this experiences are shared. Brilliant. No, thank you. I, I think that sounds like a very worthy, noble goal, and I hope that is well attended. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming on Business Unusual. Denford, we haven't even touched on your on your role in the committee looking at bread prices, so I'm sure that we have a lot to talk about. Soon, yeah, we but, do have a lot. Yeah. But, but anyway, again, um, this is Business Unusual. Um, I'd like to thank my two guests today, um, an economist from Bay Zimbabwe, Van Duzai Zirebwa, and of course, some Confederation of Zimbabwe retailers founder and president, Denford Mutashu. Um, Please, it, this is your show. This is the show that you want to ask questions. So if you have questions to ask or you have comments to make, please do not forget to contact us on our WhatsApp number 0731-168-045, Twitter and Facebook. Well, that's it for today. Business Unusual on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. Goodbye and be safe. Business Unusual. Separating economic facts from fiction.